Senator, great to have you back. Thanks for having me, Guy. I want to play some audio for the audience. This was you with a Google executive in a hearing. In Cut 34, I'm going to play this, and I'd love for you, uh, for you to explain the significance of this exchange. Listen. What do you think about General Dunford, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, his comment at the Atlantic Council a few months ago that typically, I'm quoting him, typically if a company does business in China, they're automatically going to be required to have a cell of the Communist Party in that company, and that is going to lead to the intellectual property from that company finding its way to the Chinese military. Do you, do you think he's right about that, wrong about that? Senator, we don't, we do, as I mentioned before, barely any business in China, so I don't Which have, have really the, the basis. Past. And you have tried to. 2010, we exited the country. All right, Senator, explain the significance of that exchange. You had some very harsh words for Google uh, in the aftermath of that hearing. The, the significance of the exchange is that Google has done a massive amount of business in China and is attempting to do more business even now. And the truth is, Guy, that Google has been very willing to engage in ideological censorship in China at the behest of the Chinese government when it suited their business purposes for years in China. They had a search engine, Google.cn, it was called, that censored things like Tiananmen Square, that blocked uh, uh, Chinese citizens uh, from finding out information about what the Communist Party was doing. Google did this in in partnership at the behest of the Chinese government. Since that time, they've attempted to get back in the Chinese market with another search engine called Project Dragonfly. Same thing, also censorship. So Google has been more than willing to partner with the Chinese government. They've been more than willing to open themselves up to uh, potential espionage by the Chinese government, and they've been more than willing to censor. So when they then turn around and say to us, oh, we would never censor conservatives in america we would never ever engage in ideological censorship we would never that's just false they've done they do it anytime it suits their business purposes yeah no i think that some of the preening that we see from major corporations to satisfy certain elements of the left in this country those principles just go out the window when they're operating overseas and they have no uh, no qualms about that, it would seem. And this goes back to a bigger issue that you've been really focusing on in the Senate, and we've talked about it a lot on this show, which is big tech, the amount of power that they have, the amount of information that they have, and the, I would say, fairly systemic disdain or contempt for right of center Americans. Uh, you yeah, know, these I mean, are I've, companies yeah. based, you know, based out in Silicon Valley, um, and there's a lot of groupthink out there where. Conservative whistleblowers have said we are punished internally for holding these views. And I do, I share at least your concern, Senator, about that type of hive mind having so much control, isolated, concentrated control over so much information. It, it, it really is. It's incredibly dangerous uh, to have these companies really just two or three. I mean, we're talking about Google, we're talking about Facebook, and we're talking about Twitter to some extent, but particularly Google and Facebook in terms of the information flow that they control and the, the social communication that they control and uh, the information, the personal information to which they have access. I mean, for a lot of years, conservatives have worried about how much personal information government is collecting on individuals, and that's worth worrying about. But, you know, these companies have far more access to our information and control over it than government has ever dreamed of. And what are they doing with it? I mean, you know, they're selling it without our consent. Uh, they are they are, are turning it over to who knows uh, what parties. And, you know, Google's willingness to do business with the Chinese government, uh, while they're refusing, by the way, to do business with our own Department of Defense. They won't help the Department of Defense because they say, oh, that that's they have moral qualms. But they don't have any moral qualms about partnering with the Communist Chinese Party. So it it really, I think, raises a host of, of really serious questions. It's time we held them accountable. They shouldn't get a free pass. I agree with these serious questions. I'm not sure that we fully agree about the solution here because, first of all, there's the point about private business, right? I understand that they're the modern equivalent of the public square. I think that's true to some extent. These are private businesses that the American people are you know, voluntarily signing up to do business with, right? People are making their own Facebook accounts. People are using Google as opposed to some of their competitors that are, you know, uh, tiny compared to Google. And I'm just not sure as a conservative, do I want more government involvement and regulation against private business, A, and B, even if I were to be persuaded that it was a good idea on some level, why would I have any confidence in the federal government to be 
effective or fair-minded or unbiased in that oversight? Well, I think the question we should be asking is, do we want the federal government to continue subsidizing these giant monopolies who are willing to partner with our enemies and repress, suppress conservative speech and other political speech that they don't like in the United States? I mean, should they continue to get massive federal government subsidies? Because that's what they're getting right now. These guys, Google and Facebook and Twitter, they're getting a special deal that amounts to a massive subsidy every year from the federal government. It's a kind of a subsidy that no other platform like them, no other publisher, no other communications platform gets. Certainly your station, your platform doesn't get it. Fox News doesn't get it. No media company gets it, but they get it, and it is worth billions to them, and yet they they think that they should be totally unaccountable. They should be treated differently than anybody else. So my view is is that if they are going to be neutral, if they're going to truly not engage in censorship, then maybe they can keep their special deal from government. Uh, But if they're going to be censors, if, if they're going to discriminate against conservative viewpoints or libertarian viewpoints, or frankly, any viewpoints on the basis of political viewpoint, political speech, then they should be treated like any other media company in this country. But if the people that are holding them accountable, in your words, are government bureaucrats, some of whom are political appointees, and the Democrats are in charge, why would conservative Americans say, okay, let's give government regulators and bureaucrats more power to enforce fairness when their view of fairness might be just as left wing or worse uh, than what we're seeing from Silicon Valley? I mean, it's like turning over more power to the government, hoping for better outcomes to me just always raises a red flag of suspicion, Senator. Well, I would say this, that you don't allow the bureaucrats to decide what is and what isn't fair. I mean, what you do is, is that you, you say, let's, let's use the First Amendment standard. Let's use the standard that, that Americans know and embrace, that American courts have developed for 50-plus years. It's called the viewpoint neutrality standard. It's very familiar in American law. It's applied all of the time in many different contexts. Uh, it, it's an even-handed standard. and and make Google and Facebook submit to that. By the way, I, I'm not for, sometimes people talk about a fairness doctrine in the tech space. I'm not for a fairness doctrine. That's yeah, that was my next question. Give, <laughs> yeah, I'm not for that, where you say you have to give both sides equal time. And, you know, I just, I, I, I'm against that. But I do think that if we're going to subsidize these companies, and if they're going to get a special deal that no other media company gets, that no other publisher gets, no other platform gets, then they should not be censoring, and they should not be discriminating. But by the way, guy, that's only one piece of the problem with these companies. We also need to protect privacy. Consumers shouldn't have their data taken from them by Google without even knowing about it. So there ought to be, Google shouldn't be able to do that. You should be able to say, I don't want to be tracked by Google all the way around the web. Uh, They ought to be able to opt out. They ought to be able to get all their data back. You should be able to say, I want you, Google, to delete all the data you've collected on me or pay me for it. I mean, they ought, consumers ought to have these options. And so I think there are a lot of steps we can take here to hold these companies accountable and to get real competition. We need more competition. We need a freer market here. We need more accountability. So I feel like with with Google and Facebook, one of the biggest problems that I have, of course, you know, when they are out there discriminating or they have their thumb on the scale ideologically and they're punishing viewpoints that they don't like among their employees or even elsewhere, that does concern me. And we talk about it. We blow the whistle. I'm going to be out in California next week actually meeting with a very top person at Facebook. I'll talk about that next week. I think it's important for us to apply pressure uh, when it comes to ideology and fairness and that sort of thing, Um, and or at least just not shifting the playing field in one direction or another. When it comes to the privacy stuff, Senator, I think the thing that concerns me the most is what they will say is, well, people have agreed to this stuff, right? We are taking all this data because it's in the terms of service. People maybe don't read all that, but they just say, great, this seems fun. I'm going to do it. And then they are unwittingly, but they are consenting to all of that. Do you think that that's a fair counterpoint? And I know that you think that some of these companies have been openly dishonest about some of that. If you will, touch on that concern. You bet. Yeah, it, it is. It is no response. The companies say it all the time. It's just not true because they don't tell consumers anywhere what they're collecting. Let's take Google again. Let's take the Android phone. 
you would think that if you turned off your Wi-Fi on the phone, if you turned off your location tracking on the phone, that your phone is not actually connecting to Wi-Fi, that it's not keeping track of you, that it's not monitoring you, you would be wrong. In fact, the phone does that, even if you have it switched off, if you have those services switched off. And worse, it communicates that information to Google as soon as you log on to a cellular connection. Whether you want it to or not, you can't stop it. Now, not only does Google not disclose this, they actively mislead you. In fact, I had a Google executive say on, before me in committee under oath that uh, Google doesn't track. And I said, well, wait a minute. What about this? Isn't this true about the Android? Finally, he admitted, okay, well, yeah, that, that's accurate. I mean, so this is the kind of thing, Guy, that we get time and time again where the companies are outright lying in some instances about what information they're collecting. Consumers have no ability to opt out of it. I mean, this isn't a free market. This isn't free anything. I mean, this is monopoly behavior by people who think that they should be in control and don't have to answer to anybody. And we've got to do something about it. Senator, last topic, news of the day, the president uh, going back and forth with the so-called squad. There was that Resolution passed last night in the House of Representatives on the tweets. Uh, Nancy Pelosi calling them racist. A lot of a lot of people calling what the president said racist. It seems like tonight in North Carolina, he's going to have a, a big megaphone again to blast back. Uh, what's your take on what the president said, and whether you think you know whether or not you would agree that it was racist and worthy of a condemnation? Do you think that sort of language, you know, calling fellow you know fellow elected officials anti-America, hatred, you know, hating America, is that helpful in your mind? Well, first of all, I mean, if you look at some of the comments that have been made by quite a number of Democrats, actually, I was just down at the border guy uh, talking with Border Patrol agents, seeing uh, the McAllen uh, border station, which is the busiest part of the border, to call our American law enforcement agents who are just doing their duty down there at the border. And by the way, they're doing a really good job to compare them, to call them equivalent to Nazis in a concentration camp facility. I think that's pretty un-American. I mean, I, I think that's pretty offensive. To say the kind of things that so many Democrats have said about Jewish Americans and have said about the state of Israel, you know, basically the only reason you would support Israel is if you were paid, or that right. Jewish Americans have dual loyalties. I mean, this is the kind of rank anti-Semitism that I didn't think existed in this country anymore, and yet the Democrats can't seem to stop saying that stuff, and they can't, they can't uh, uh, condemn it. So I think there's a lot of frustration, I can say, here on Capitol Hill, a lot of frustration with the kind of hatred and vitriol that gets spewed by the left day after day after day will not be reported by the establishment media. And I think you see the president expressing that frustration. Senator Josh Hawley is a first-termer out of Missouri, and he has arrived in town and made a splash. We're feeling those ripples, and he's hit the ground running. Senator, we always love having you here. Thanks so much for having me.